is if you happen to see, just like serial numbers and model numbers, if you are able to read data back from the smart table, then you probably at least have a basic functioning drive. You might have actually made it through the firmware and the PCB board and the system area, which tells you a lot about the drive because at this point in time, if you made it through smart and you read smart and it returns data, even if you got no user data, you know that you probably have at least a good head. Maybe not all the heads are good, but the system head is good, which is needed to read that information. And th that means that your board's probably in good shape, that your board probably actually functioned. There's a few exceptions, and I'm going to try to talk a little bit about exceptions because that's kind of the focus of what I'm doing here. You people are all basically using USB for everything. Like, let's use a laptop, plug in a hard drive, let's do a data recovery. USB sucks. Did you guys not remember how bad USB was to begin with in doing things? USB has no control over this drive whatsoever. When you plug the drive into USB, a mass storage driver starts up and Windows starts this little API thing that talks to the drive. It's generic. It's very generic. It's basically, hey, okay, you got some data, give it to me, and that's it. But when it comes to actually doing data recovery, like most of you probably have drives that if you actually plugged it into a real ATA controller on a real motherboard, which I know nobody's seen these things anymore. Apparently they're all, you know, ooh, I bought a Dell and it's in a case and nobody knows how to get to the motherboard anymore. But ultimately that's the issue is that if you plug the drive actually into the motherboard, instead of trying to use USB to do a recovery, you would fix a big portion of your problem. Probably 60% of the stuff that you have that actually had problems, you could probably read just by plugging into a, and again, Motherboards have crappy ATA controllers. The ATA controller that's on there is you know, sold to the cheapest manufacturer of the week or whatever it is that they, they did from some Chinese manufacturer. If you actually bought a decent board, uh, and the funny thing is that some of the decent boards are actually cheaper than, than anything else out there right now because RAID controllers that actually support just regular IDE or regular SATA drives, they don't have to all be set up as RAIDs. Older ones like Adaptec 1200A controllers and stuff, uh, were fantastic boards in their day, and they're a PCI controller, and they're only like 12 bucks on eBay. But because they're old school technology, everybody's moved ahead to the new stuff. Nobody went out and you know is still bought and still using those those controllers. So even buying a really good controller that was three or four years ago, it might not give you 100% of the support for all the changes today in ATA standard eight or whatever. But you can you can still use that to do a fantastic job on recovery. Uh, so ultimately, that's the first thing I would say is make sure you're using the ATA controller, getting a better controller, trying to do something else with that, uh, using some software to look at the status lights. We're going to do this in just a second. Uh, some people are stuck with trying to do things with eSATA, and they might only have a laptop. Believe it or not, the control set, you can't use it through USB, but if you have a, a, an eSATA card in your laptop, it actually will respond to the ATA command set, and you can use a Windows version of what's called Victoria and install a driver for your eSATA card, and you would actually be able to control it through a laptop and do the same type of recovery stuff you would be able to do. But you can only do that on eSATA, not on USB. Yeah, same problem. Yeah, you can all have complete control. You have more control, but not complete control. Um, and then PIO mode. So uh, I've mentioned this before in some other talks, but it's really simple from a standpoint of almost all your controllers are currently using UDMA to do transfers. And in certain cases, you know, it's kind of like our old problem with CD-ROMs where you had, you know, 1X, and when you went to 52X, all of a sudden there were some problems writing because it was trying to do things too fast. Well, in certain cases, just switching your controller to PIO mode, which in Windows is just in the control panel, there's a way to do it. You can go switch the adapter to PIO mode instead of UDMA mode. Uh, believe it or not, I will tell you probably 20 or 30% more of the times that you can't read data or you can't read in reverse will be solved with that. Just go to PIO mode instead of using, and so if you're on Linux, there's other ways to do it, but ultimately you'd be able to read more content back from your drive than you would be able to do any other way. Uh, the only thing is it's going to be about five times slower than doing it through UDMA, uh, and then doing it in reverse will add another five times slower. So if you're doing it in reverse in PIO mode, it's ten times slower than it would be if you were doing it through UDMA or, or approximately. Exactly. That's my point. Any kind of reading. But that will end up being a problem like, you know, you're still kind of blind as you're reading the data. It may take a week for you to read, you know, a 200 gig drive. But most people, you know, that's one of the situations where hardware is going to be much faster. It will solve your problem faster. You'll know what's going on faster. But you may still be able to solve your problem for free instead of sending it to somebody for $2,000 to do that job, if that makes sense. But you might have to wait a week. There's nothing about data recovery that's fast. I'll tell you that right now. The fastest thing is the FedEx guy bringing it to you. 
That's the fastest thing in data recovery. Nothing else is fast. So, uh, so keep that in mind as you're looking at these other things. Uh, DD Rescue being free is awesome. Media Tools Pro is $300. Uh, X-Ways Replica is one of the other few pieces of software that actually does imaging in reverse. And I listed a couple others. Uh, there's a $40 piece of software uh, called Speed Clone that does it in reverse, but you don't have much more control over anything else. But basically, that's my list of you know, the basics of getting you to this spot where we can actually now start looking at some diagnostics things. So this is, uh, and you're going to see my brainstorm here in a minute, which is going to look like a colossal mess. But uh, uh, ultimately, this is kind of the list of things that I go down when I'm trying to do a, a basic kind of diagnostic. So you can go get this off the website. I'm going to break every single one of these down as I go through it on the pages following this. But ultimately, I'm looking to see if the drive comes ready. Am I getting a response? Uh, it, does it, do I actually get some sort of lights or you know, am I able to read serial numbers, things like that? Does the motor spin, scraping sounds? Uh, so here's my flow chart. Okay, this is not all of the possible choices that you have for diagnostics, but it's kind of just the quick mind map of the things that are possible for you to do on your own and then just kind of where to stop because there's going to be a spot where you go, look, this is beyond what you can actually do. So again, this is up on the website, so you can go download it. You don't have to memorize what I have up here. But uh, so I'm starting here. Basically, the yeses go this way and the noes go this way. Uh, and so I'm basically going through each step and then trying to figure out we, what each step of it is along the way and what my choices are. So let's look at it. These are some of the exceptions that I want to talk about. Uh, so for instance, if I got a drive in and it's a Seagate drive, normally anything that was before, say, December of 2008, I might be able to just start doing diagnostics and do a basic thing and it would be the same for all drives. But there's some exceptions to everything. So for instance, if I know that I have a drive that's labeled 7211, 7212, that they have a specific firmware problem. And that firmware problem uh, exhibits itself in two ways. One is I can read a serial number, but I don't get a size. So I actually get the serial number from the drive, but I don't get a size. Uh, another one is uh, that it always stays busy and never comes ready. So those are two of the symptoms of a firmware failure that would be exceptions that normally would not be the case with the drive under other circumstances. So there'll be a few of those, so I'll go through a couple of those. And then I'm going to talk about Western Digital, the same kind of thing with what actually happens with them, and then the common things that all the drives can have. So Seagates, these are the basic things. You see this label and you see a 7211, the very first thing that you should be thinking is, hey, I probably got a firmware problem if the drive doesn't come ready or if I can't blah, blah, blah. So just keep that in mind before you go, hey, I need to replace boards or I need to replace heads. Uh, you just stop and think here. Now, if you want to know a little bit more, you can. So here's a link basically to go get this cable. This is a USB cable that uh, basically you can rip off three wires off of here. So here's the wires you're going to need. An orange wire off of, that, off of this cable, which is whatever it is in here, orange, and then this one that's a yellow wire. And on a 7211 or, or any Actually, any Seagate drive, Seagate is the only drives that have a direct connection through a serial port that you can monitor just through terminal or through anything else. You can just plug them straight in, set the baud rate, and then talk to them. And there's, I've got instructions out there on how to do that and do whatever, and I have the other diagrams uh, on another website. Uh, if you just hit my site, you'll, you'll actually find them. But um, basically, I'm going to plug the orange wire into here on the SATA connector and then the yellow wire on here. Uh, these are usually the ones that actually control speed of operation. There is a serial report. And then I'll actually see a screen, and I can start to find things out. So this is an example of a screen. Now, this particular thing, actually, as soon as the drive powers on, it will actually start to tell me content. It'll actually say, oh, here's my model number, here's my drive, here's the things that I can do. And then if you have a head error, it'll actually say HM, and it'll say head mask error, and you'll actually see that go across the screen. So those kind of things you can actually fix by doing head replacements. If you know enough about them, you can actually go through the process, which is what my other talks have been about. In this case, I'm going to tell you where to stop. In this instance, this is going to be a video, and this is what's actually going to happen if you have a problem you cannot fix. One of them. This is called a pending bug. So if you see this scrolling past your screen like this, that's where you stop because there is nothing you can do without special equipment. You need a special $7,000, $13,000 box in order to fix this problem. Your data is completely fine. In most cases, your data is completely fine. Your problem is, is that there's a bug in Seagate's firmware that actually says, hey, look, 